Isn't that scary? What if God should tell you? We'll do it your way. I mean, that's scary for me. Because I want to have guidelines. I want to be able to succeed. And to be able to succeed, I need to study. And to study, I need to have materials that I need, need to study so I can surpass. But when you tell me something like, do it your way, I know I'm going to fail because you gave me no parameters for success. See, we automatically strive to do things our own way. And we ignore that God has set forth parameters so we can succeed. We look at God's parameters as a way to be able to limit us from enjoying ourselves, but don't understand that God has given us parameters so we can succeed. Without directions, we are lost. Have you ever gone to Burger King lately? And Burger King has this motto. Have it your way. Have you realized that even though that's their motto, you don't get it your way? Because the person that is supposed to make it your way has to listen to you so you can have it your way. But when they're not listening, they're going to give it to you in their way. And then you're go, going to go back and say, I'm allergic to pickles. I asked you no pickles. You put pickles into it. And then they're going to say the magic word that makes everything better. I'm sorry. Anybody else understand the sarcasm in it? Because we get to think that saying I'm sorry makes things better. So we give the same attitude to God. I mess up. I'm sorry. No, you're not sorry. Sorry means I have guilt inside of me. This really bothered me. This has affected me. I will not do that again. That's not what sorry means to you. It just means shut up. So what? Everybody makes mistakes. It doesn't mean I'm sorry. We come to church with the same attitude. I'm sorry. No, you're not. You're not sorry. I understand what I am sorry means. We recently uh, ate some rabbits. Well, I had to euthanize the rabbits so we can eat them. While I was eating the rabbits, nothing inside of me said, I'm sorry. Because I was enjoying the rabbits. Inside my heart, I didn't feel guilt for having to kill the rabbits. And someone felt guilty about the rabbits. I can see her grief as she decided, I will not eat it. I keep thinking of cute rabbit. See, that's what I'm sorry looks like. Even though everybody was partaking of the rabbit's flesh, she refused to. Because that was a cute rabbit. She was sorry for the rabbit. Well, let her not eat for five days. I guarantee you her sorrow will diminish. Because something else will kick in. It's called hunger. I think some of us need to experience some spiritual hunger today. Do not be conformed to this world. All right, we're just going to start with the premise here. If you are in this world and everything about this world is okay with you, you're already going to miss this whole message. Because the instructions is don't find conformity in the world you live in. Don't sit back and relax. 
Don't sit here and get your little mojito and just, uh, oh, uh, we are on vacation. This is lovely. Don't be conformed to this world. But be transformed. So conformity, instead of being having conformity, you should have transfer transformation. By what? By renewing your mind. By making your mind new. By taking away all the stuff you think you knew and putting in new things. Making it renew. Having the prefix re, which means again. Renewed of your mind. By, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. By testing. When I am testing something, I don't know what's the answer to the test until I've tested all. If you were to tell me, which one is better, Coca-Cola or Pepsi? And you give me a Coke and it says Coca-Cola on it. And you give me a Pepsi and it says Pepsi on it. Even though I'm going to taste both of them. I already have in my mind which one I'm going to pick. See, that's how we feel that God wants us to test. Well, we already know all the information and it's like, come up with your conclusion. No, we're going to do a blind test. That means I'm going to give you some Coke, Coca-Cola. Don't get it confused. I'm going to give you some Coca-Cola. And you're not going to know it's Coca-Cola. I'm going to give you some Pepsi. You're not going to know it's Pepsi. And I'm going to give you another brand that's an unknown brand. I'm going to make it all three. And I'm going to have you pick which one's better, A, B, or C. And you are a lifelong Coca-Cola fan. I only drink Coke and nothing else but Coke. And then I give you the result of your blind test and I tell you you have chosen the one that tastes the best is the public coke not coca-cola oh I could have done that yeah you did you thought that public fake coke was better than the real coke and better than the pepsi The Bible says here, test to see what's the will of God. That means that you're not going to know what's the will of God because you're not used to God's voice yet. You got to go through a process where I'm learning his voice. I'm learning what his voice sounds like. The problem about testing is every once in a while you get a wrong answer. Here in the United States, we like to teach the test. And we have discovered that people can pass the test and still be dummies. Because they only know the test and don't know anything else. While we want you to pass the test, we also want you to know. So we go to church and we want the pastor to teach us the test. So we can pass the test. But still know nothing. Because we didn't take the time to study on our own. See, we're like that individual who says, I don't know why God keeps allowing the policemen to give me speeding tickets. Well, we know it's not God's fault that you got the speeding ticket. The fault is you keep on speeding. Start speeding, you won't get speeding tickets. We decide we want to test God on something like that. I'm going to see if I can go all the way to Atlanta and not get a speeding ticket this time. See if God's with me. No. God's not with you if you're going to speed. The problem is you're speeding. That by testing you may discern what's the will of God. Well, I need to test to learn what's God's will. That means I try several times different ways. I tried several times, different ways. Well, if it was the will of God, they wouldn't be trying so many different ways. It would just be easy. That's not what this verse says. 
Is that what your verse says? The first time you try, you're going to get it right. That's not what it says, right? What is good and acceptable and perfect. I like this because it has three degrees. Did you get the three degrees? First one is good. Our church is a good church. We got the first level. Our church is an acceptable church. In today's time, acceptable is not even something that's considered good. Do y'all know we consider acceptable worse than good? But God doesn't consider acceptable worse than good. He considers acceptable better than good. Because acceptable gets you in. You get accepted into the program. You got in. You are in. Well, you cannot get acceptable into the program unless you're first good. You got to get be good to get accepted. So which one is greater? Acceptable is greater than good. After accept, acceptable is perfect. I need to learn God's will by these three degrees. First degree is I need to learn what's good for God. That's not perfect. It's good. Once I got this good part, man, I need to know what's acceptable to God. That's better than good. But my aim is perfect. My aim is perfect. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. While you want it your way, while you want to do the things you want to do when you want to do it, understand that you are the total opposite of what Jesus said. Because Jesus did not say, we're going to have it your way. This is not Burger King. Jesus said, it is my way. It's, I am the only way. The only way to the Father is through Jesus. Jesus answered. Don't miss that out. Jesus said it. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are a lot of ands in here. In the English language, there would only be one and in there. It will be I am the way, comma, truth, comma, and the life. But the and here are because they are all inclusive. They are all as important. Therefore, a comma can't make it because a comma just says these three. While the and say all three are just as important. I am the way and the truth and the life. Way, truth, life. That Jesus. Way, truth, life. All three. Now, if you just have one, you missed all three. If you have two, you missed all three. Because you have to have all three or none. So you are a Christian and you want to do it your way. You missed it. Because it's his way. Well, I believe in my own truth. Well, you miss it because it is truth, his truth. It's my life. I get to do what I want to do. No, it's his life. All three. No one gets to the Father except through him. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. First of all, Paul says here, work, but don't only work when I'm around. 
Oh, I've seen that in church. Pastor's not here. There's a break. Pastor, come back. Oop, there we go. Start working again. And I'm like, why are they doing that? Aren't they doing this for God? Because if you stop and when I leave, you're not doing it for God. You're doing it to impress me. Failed to tell you, not impressed. I'm not impressed by that. Would you be impressed by that? I'm impressed to go away and find out the stuff was done. It's like, ooh, man, we got a good worker. It says here, work out your own. Do you all read that? Is that in there? Work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. What do you mean work out my own salvation? See, in the military, everybody got a rucksack. It was a bag that you had to carry things. Inside the thing that you had to carry, you had like tent and tent poles and you had a, a small shovel and sometimes you had your MRE. Uh, you know, you had your own stuff that you had to carry around you. You had some water, you had a canteen, you had bullets that went into your weapon. You, you had a knife. You had a compass. See, when the Bible says work out your own salvation, it means carry your own load. Carry your own rucksack. Well, then the Bible says to carry one another's burden. Yeah, that's when your burden is so heavy you can't carry it by yourself. But there's a burden that you're supposed to carry all by yourself. There's a burden that's yours. It's not no community effort. Stop being lazy. Carry your own stuff. Oh, but I, I need help. Everybody needs help sometime. But if you need help all the time, something wrong with you. If you're always kind of, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. 20 years from now, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, 40 years from now, it's me, it's me. By then, you got other people that are right behind you who, who you have developed, who all joined the choir. It's me. It's me. It's me. Oh, it's me. Uh, and it becomes everybody just needs prayer. Aren't we supposed to grow to where we can lead others? How can we lead others when we always need someone to lead us? Why do we feel that it's okay to always be at the back of the line? Well, everybody can't be leaders. And God gave them dominion. God made man, Adam, and he gave him dominion over the sea, over the creeping thing over the beast of the field over the, the beast of the air he gave them dominion and you're saying you're not a leader so he put us in charge and you don't want to be in charge because it's easy it's easy not be in charge while it's easy for you not be in charge, you get in the way of people who are in charge. Because that's an attitude of a little two-year-old having a tantrum. You know how hard it is for a parent that has to go somewhere and the two-year-old is having a tantrum. The parent has to stop what they're doing to gather that child that's having a tantrum. Because that child could care less about the parent's time. We get that way. We come to church and it's like, I'm just here because, you know, it's what I'm supposed to do. 
Who lied to you? Because coming to church does not give you brownie points. It's a life that you live. It's a life that you live outside of church. You call yourself Christian? How many of your friends will agree with you? How many, honestly? Some of you who have friends, because some of you us don't know how to make friends. How many would agree you're a Christian? See, I just said that, and then some people just, their heads just went down. Well, you know, Pastor, no one's perfect. No, I told, I said that in the message, what, two weeks ago? There's no one pre uh, uh, perfect. No, not one. Except Jesus. That was written in. David wrote it. By then, you know, had he hadn't met Jesus yet. No, there's no one perfect. But people do understand the difference of being a Christian and speaking Christianese. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his pleasure. You're not made for your pleasure. You're made for God's pleasure. You're not made to do what you want to do when you want to do it. You're made so God could have you do what he wants you to do when he wants you to do it. How many are right now standing in the way of God doing what he wants to do in your life? I mean, you're just resolute. I'm going to be God and I don't care about God. Because I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to say what I want to say. I'm going to go where I want to go. I'm going to have it my way. This statement implies a need to live out. To practice. To demonstrate. To exhibit. The salvation which believers have in Christ. See, when you're carrying your own load... You're showing people I practice what I hear. I'm going to demonstrate it. Another word for it, demonstrate, which is bigger, is exhibit. Turn on the light and everybody see the salvation that I believe in Christ. Go ahead and shine that light on us. Come on, enemy. Let everybody see all my areas. Because I'm a true believer in Christ. How many takers do we have? How many right now, if a light should shine on you that the world could see you, would you be resolute to show I'm of Christ? Or would some of us be surprised at what we find in the closets? Yesterday I was listening to the news and the Kardashians former dad because now he's a woman is running for governor of California on the Republican ticket. You know I don't know the person because I can't call him the woman. He was born a man. I am not politically correct. So sorry. Because in heaven he's in those books that it's written of him. Yeah, the books are in heaven. I didn't say he's going to heaven. Because in Revelation it says and the books were open. The, the books are in heaven. He was born a, a boy. He was male. When he came out of the womb, he had this little appendage that was hanging from, from his crotch area, and the doctor said, it's a boy. I don't care if he got it removed. Still a boy to God. Dressed like a girl. Why he wants to lead? What makes him leadership quality? Do you know what makes him leadership quality? 
all the churchgoers that refuse to do anything but sit down. See, the Bible says this, and he's going to cause the rocks to cry out in our place. Well, what's a rock? Something that's not alive. Well, spiritually speaking, what's not alive? Uh, uh, someone who has not been converted. They're dead. They are a rock. You are living in a generation where the rocks are crying out and the church people are silent. Saying stupid stuff. I can't have friends. In which society is it hard to make friends? Come on, I know I've traveled a lot. Can you name me one society in the world that is hard to make friends? If you're wondering, there's none. Because the Bible says how to make friends. Y'all know that verse? Show yourself friendly. I've said that for years in our church and I've watched the same people who have problems making friends stay the same. Stay to themselves. Here comes all these folks. They're to themselves. I don't have any friends. Your fault. Your fault you don't have friends. Because pastor has no problem making friends. Matt, I have friends that are in the Ku Klux Klan. Think that one through. Yeah, I, we have nice conversations too. You can sit down and eat together. And uh, Don't you hate black people? Yeah, I hate black people. I can't stand black people. But that's your friend. He's different. And I'm looking at myself like, how am I different? I don't understand how I'm different. I'm black just like the other person is black. We don't have to be alike to make friends. The people who can't make friends are just stubborn. They just want to be like who they want to be. Accept me like how I am. Okay, fine. I accept it like how you are. Stop complaining about how you are then. I accepted you. Stop complaining. That's who you are. Be happy. I remember we went to Miami once to the... I don't have any friends. And the people in Miami felt sorry for that individual. While well, I was mad. I was mad. Because I'm like, why are you going to stand up there and say that? And now let the people know I never go talk to anybody. I stay to myself. I'm not friendly. I don't know what to say. I don't approach anybody. I sit my tail down and just look at the world pass around me. And then I complain that I'm sitting down watching the world pass around me. Because everybody here wants someone to save you out of your own mess. Because you don't want to carry your own load. It's your load. Carry it. It's yours. Carry it. It's not something that someone's supposed to save you from you. That's who you are. It's an easy fix. No, it's not, Pat. Yes, it is. It's an easy fix. Very easy. You can go anywhere. See, you haven't seen us in public. Maybe you need to be around us when we go in public. And find out that the person in the back of the line in Walmart, right behind me, is a good candidate for me to have a conversation with. But we're stuck together. I'm in line, they're in line. This line always goes this slow. That's what I said in Arkansas. We were at Walmart in Arkansas. In line. Two and a half hours. And we were the second one. And I'm looking at that individual and like, oh, Father, deliver me from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. 
And I look at the next line and I see the same thing. And I look at the next line and I see that everybody is like in this little snail pace. And I look at the person behind me and I said, is this always this slow here in Arkansas? He said, is that slow everywhere y'all go? I said, I live in Alabama. I never thought we'll see people slower than Alabamians. They need to go to Alabama and get a lesson. Y'all are too slow. <laughs> The poor lady in the front started getting annoyed with me. <laughs> now here comes a supervisor. Supervisor moves out of the way. Just move, move, move. That'll be 4297. Then a supervisor went to the other line where they were working too slow. Move out of the way. Then the supervisor went to the other line. And the supervisor went to the other line. And then somebody dropped something and it broke. And the supervisor went and got the broom and got the little dustpan and picked it up. And I thought to myself, the only person that works here is the supervisor. And I thought of church. So that's how we are. That's how we are in church where everybody else is going in the snail pace and our customers are complaining. So then the customers choose someone that's not like Christ to follow because we just can't wake up. See, the Bible says that when we're asleep, it causes this word. We're in a stupor. Y'all understand how close that is to stupid? We get in a stupor. We miss what's going around because we get so stuck on this is who I am. Well, we don't understand that when I became a new creation, the old me was passed away and now I have a new me. But when you say this is how I am, that means that you never got a conversion experience because you're still the old you. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Wait. Understand the premise here. That means that myself doesn't want to go with. Myself don't want to be part of this. Myself is not in there. Ooh, 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 send me. No, myself is not doing that. Myself is doing the opposite. I don't want to go. Don't send me. Stop picking on me. Send somebody else. And then here is what Jesus said. You got to deny that part of you. Deny the part of you that don't want to go. He don't even say to let him go. He don't even say to forget about that part of me. It says deny it. Don't give it credit. Don't give them acknowledgement. Don't go with that. It's just say, hey, don't pay attention to that individual. I think of, you know, the Wizard of Oz. Don't pay attention to the one man behind the, the screen. Don't pay attention. You know, that's the part of me that God's saying deny. Deny themselves. What else? Take up your cross and follow me. Here we go again. Take up your burden. Stop waiting for someone to save you from you. Because we do that. Save me from myself. No. Carry your own cross. It's not the pastor's job to save you from you. It's not my job. I'm so sorry. I can't save you from you. You are you. And you're going to do what you want to do. No matter how I preach up here. At the end, you are you. It is your own choices that you are going to make. Carry your own burden. Come on. Carry your own cross. For wh whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Okay. You want to have it your way. Here's the truth of having it your way. You will not gain life. You will forever lose it.
Oh, that's not in this world. Because this world is temporary. We're temporal. It's in the world to come. You want to save your life? Go ahead and do so. But you'll lose your life. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Okay. Deny yourself. And in denying yourself, you're going to find yourself. Oh, come on. Please stay with me. I know we just had that big old noise, which is good. It probably woke some people up. Yeah, it did wake some people up. And denying yourself, your characteristic, your attributes, your gifting, you're going to discover yourself. Oh, I don't think you got, you heard me. Because mm -mm. Donna's still giving me that look. I, I'm trying to get this, Pastor. We live in an illusion. We think we are something that we are truly not. When we deny ourselves, we are denying the illusion of who we think we are. And when we're following after Christ, we're going to discover who we really are. Do we understand it better? See, who I thought I was, I found out I'm not. And then I found out I never was. It's amazing when you're talking to people. We were earlier talking about rhythm. There are people that think they have rhythm. And I have a master's degree in music. They're so far from rhythm. So far. I mean, no work. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, Lord, I... One, two, be in that number. And now I was like, oh my goodness gracious, I can't fight. I can't find the beat in that mess. But when they're singing, they're singing their heart out and they think they really got it. I had one person and once I heard it and it made me laugh. I'm sorry, I'm going to say it. And uh, it, it was not funny, but it was funny. Because this one person was in the dance ministry and the mom was tell, trying to tell them that they shouldn't be in the dance ministry because they don't have any rhythm. And the young lady says, Mom, don't take this away from me. I'm good at it. And I was laughing because she was so bad. She was just so bad. She was just so bad. I mean, we could have made $10,000 by sending that video to America's Funniest Video. You know, it was, it was so bad. But to her, she thought that that was her gift. She lived in this fallacy that she had created herself, that she was good at this. But she's not good at it. She wasn't good then. Have you not seen American Idol those first few episodes? Where the person starts singing and then they get so offended when someone tells them they don't know how to sing. I, well, that kind of sounded good. I was trying to sound bad. Hmm? I feel no ways tired. And I've come too far from where I've started from. Nobody, nobody, nobody told me that the, that the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. I feel no way tired. And I've come too far from where I've, I've started from. Nobody told me that the road, it would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Now I've seen people go on.
American Idol and all that, and when they finish, they get all upset because they didn't sing good, but they thought they sang good. I remember one lady says that I was told that when I sing, I sound like Mariah Carey. And she had pictures of her dressed like Mariah Carey and hair like Mariah Carey. And when she sang, well, I was like, who Mariah Carey should be offended. She was taking singing lessons and the teacher told her she sounded like Mariah Carey. And I was like, whoo, that teacher needs help. When we get a dose of our reality, what do we do? Come on, what do we do? You get a dose of your reality. You get your feelings hurt. You get your feel. The natural Western Amer uh, Christian, what he does or she does when they get their feelings hurt is that they go find another church. I don't go somewhere else. Because you got your little feelings hurt. What's the will of God? Amen, to make us grow up, right? Well, instead of doing what, what what's her lady, that lady's name, what love got to do, Tina Turner? Instead of what love got to do with it, what does your feeling have to do with it? What does that have to do with it? I have to deny myself of the illusion who I think I am of the things that I think I've mastered, of the things I think I've learned, I had to deny myself and carry my own burden. Carry my own. Now go to a pastor, I need you to help carry mine. The pastor got his too. See, there comes a time to where, and it shouldn't be always, to all of a sudden somebody have a burden upon them that is so heavy that we as the people of God come in and we help carry one another's burden. But the two are not the same thing. See, the burden that you're supposed to carry is the one that has been issued to you. But every once in a while, you're going to have a burden that is bigger than you. You're going to have a burden that may be a burden for the city. You may have a burden that's probably a burden for the county. You may have a burden that's probably a burden for the state. You may have a burden that's probably a burden for the nation. You may have a, a burden that's probably for the world. You can't carry that by yourself because it weighs too much. And then that's when we're like, I got mine, but I got some of yours too. I'm going to help you carry some of yours. See, our problem is this, that we have a burden here at the church that is bigger than us, but we have members in our church that won't even carry their little own rucksacks. You want us to leave the burden that we have for the world to help you carry your little 20-pound rucksack. Gain some muscles and carry your own 20 pounds because we're struggling to carry the burden that God has given us that you're supposed to help us with. Well, I don't know why he's doing that. I just think he's just doing that just to have a birthday party. I don't want nothing to do with that because that's just a birthday party. Really? When have you seen our church so full? What did it take? An invitation. Wait, remember we tried that invitation stuff with our members? How many folks did we get? Not a lot, right? We did an invitation for our function. Not many people were moved by what we had to do because you got stuck in your own will. You didn't stop and consider you know what, this may have some greater implications than what I see. I keep hearing that Lizzie didn't want this. I keep hearing Jennifer saying, this is something that God wants. Why could we not see it? Because we got stuck in our own will. Didn't carry our own cross. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world? Just forfeit 
their own soul. What good is it for you to gain everything? I want to be a billionaire. You become a billionaire. I want to buy my own private island. You got your private island. I want to buy an expensive yacht. You got your yacht. I want to buy a plane. You got your plane. You got, hey, you got whatever, everything you wanted, you got, and then you died. You lost the only thing that was of importance. Because you lived in the temporary. We're not knowing that eternity is right down the block. I had to do a funeral of a 19-year-old boy who three weeks before was in my house. And see, three weeks before that, I said these words, motorcycle are dangerous. People who have accidents in motorcycles seldom live through it. And three weeks later, he died in a motorcycle accident. Now, I didn't know that my last words that I will tell him will be the same way he died. I didn't know that. I just thought, I don't want my kid on a motorcycle. That's dangerous. You got to count on other people to be saved for you. We live in Alabama. I don't want other people to be saved for me. They don't pay attention to themselves. How are they going to pay attention to somebody else? For each one will bear his own load. Galatians 6, 5. Now, I thought it needed a little bit more explanation, so I got a colorful one up here. <laughs> you see, we got the simple verse, right? Which is what it says. For each one will bear his own load. Each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. Whose job is your life? Yours? At the end you obey God, you gain. At the end you disobey God, you lose. The winner and loser is you. It's you. We come up here and I preach every Sunday and I get I get attitudes. Now y'all don't know this because y'all some of you are sitting up there and some of you are like Amen, Amen, Amen. And get like Donna and it's like Pastor, I'm really really paying attention. But other folks are like, I don't care what you have to say. You don't have to see the people falling asleep. That's why I said we need to put a camera because the moment we go on TV, the sleeping people are going to be what we aim for. You're going to see people are not going to sleep no more in our church. We get people that the moment they sit down. Uh, you're at home playing video games all day. You're not asleep. When you get to church, you go to sleep the moment you sit down. Oh, yeah, I know. Video games. All throughout the night. Video games. Sit down. Learn something that can make something of you. This is boring. Because video games going to make you money. Oh, they don't think that. They know they can't do that. Can't compete with the Japanese. <laughs> that takes work. Compete. Come on, let's be honest. We're not competitive in our county. We're not competitive in our city. No, we're not. You see the fallacy? I'm glad that Donna said that because it's a falsehood. You know, we, we put on something false. Yeah, I'm going to design video games. That's why I played all... No, you're not. You don't even know the first thing of designing. Designing and playing is not the same. The person who is designing a video game is so busy designing, they don't even have time to play it. They have to hire other people to play it for them because they're too busy designing. Just a dose of reality. Same today, 
as was yesterday, little to no growth. Here, five reasons. Why are there people with little to no growth? They presume upon grace. God will forgive me. God is love. You know, it's all good. We get that Miley Cyrus song. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has those days. We start singing it as, as our mantra. They presume on God's grace. There are many there are in a church that really haven't changed. Same problems reoccur over and over and over and over. They're presuming on God's grace. Second one. They doubt their conversion. Well, I don't know if I'm really saved. You know, it didn't really stick the first time. Third reason. They are discouraged by their progress. See, I asked my son why he keep messing up. He says that he gets discouraged. So when he gets discouraged, he messes up more. That's what you, well, you keep messing up. You, you know, I get discouraged. Okay, that doesn't make logical sense, but I understand for your logic, that must make sense. That you mess up and, you know, you start messing up more because you messed up. Some of you are looking at me all confused. I can't explain it to you. I don't understand that myself. They're discouraged by their own process. I can't explain it. I don't understand it. I don't get discouraged by my lack of progress because I realize progress, I don't have to get discouraged. Just keep on moving forward. I don't have to worry about moving back. I don't understand it. See, my son, the moment I give him something good, the next day he's going to mess it up. I promise you. Reward him for something. Next day, it's like, why did you reward him for something? Say, like, okay, he just needs to live on punishment. And he lives good on punishment. Who doesn't that sound like us? They conform themselves to the world. What does that mean? That you look at the world and you make comparisons and say, I'm okay. But we're not supposed to be of this world. We're in this world, but not of this world. Didn't you see the first verse that we read? Don't conform, but be transformed. So you're sitting here and you're going to conform. It's amazing that sometimes I will preach something and you'll ask somebody what I preach and they'll say something totally opposite of what I said. I mean, total opposite. And it's like, what? I didn't say that. It's videotape. Go back on the video and see what I said. Oh, you put it into your own lingo. And your own lingo is, this is how I am. So this is how I do it. So that's what he said. Last one. They are lazy. Lazy. Some of our young folks, so we have, Sela told me that she asked somebody in her family to come and help do some work. I said, no, don't do that. She's like, why not? Because they're lazy. All they're going to do is sit, sit there and watch. And then say they're tired. And wait for, to eat. Said, they're lazy. That doesn't help. Being lazy doesn't help. A lazy person helps anybody. Come on, raise your hand if a lazy person has ever helped you. They consume. They take away. They don't give. They're a weight. A burden. A distraction. Why would we want to be any of those things? I remember for, for at least a year, at least a year, some of you who have been with us will remember. Brothers, I need you to build a wall in the back. 
Y'all remember that? Every Sunday, I need the wall built. I need that wall built back there. My brothers, I need the wall built. We had brothers in our church. None of them moved. So I decided to take matters upon myself and start building the wall. Then one of the men came in and said, Pastor, you're building it wrong. Oh, it took everything in me. Not to let this Miami person that grew up in the hood come to the surface. I had to deny myself. <laughs> because what I wanted to do was just grab him by the neck and not let go. But that's not what I did. Because if I asked you for a year to build a wall in the back, why are you going to show up when I decide to do it? That doesn't make it, as Donna said, makes them look good. No, it doesn't. It doesn't make anybody look good. It doesn't make anybody look good. You might as well just stay home. And see, what happened is, we have messages like this, and guess what? I hurt the men's feelings. So then the men left, and their wives stay. So what does that say about our great state of Alabama? I'm just saying. <laughs> I know it's not politically correct, but if the men left and the wife remain, the wife is stronger than the men. Is that God's order? None of our women want to marry men who can't hear truth about themselves and change the truth of what they hear about themselves. So today, if I were to say, men, we need a, a wall built in the back. Next Sunday, will that wall be there? No. How about next Sunday? No. How about next Sunday? You know, everything that's got built around here, I had to be here for it to get built. I think that God is looking for a new generation of people. People that can deny themselves. You know, if the pastor is asking for a wall to be built back there, he must see that there's a need for this wall to get built. And he asked nicely, I'm not paying for the wall. He's paying the cost. If I can go over there and just put some boards together, the wall is going to go up. But that's not what happens. What happens is we have the excuses. I cannot possibly do anything more than what I'm doing right now. Really? Because I'm doing more. I'm doing more. There's only one family in here that has a bigger family than mine. And that person is always here helping. So I have the second largest family in the church. I have jobs. Now compare yourself. Because you like to make comparisons, so now make a quick comparison. Who has more to do? Come on, you like to compare, so compare now. Because it's easy to compare oranges to apples. Because they're different, but now compare oranges to oranges. Who has more to do? So tell me your excuse again, because I want to hear it. See, we've had people that are starting to move forward. Man, the people that start moving forward realize their excuses don't hold water. They have come to realize I can make all the excuses in the world, but at the end, it's excuses. It's not going to be any good. It reminds me of another song, excuses, excuses. We hear them every day. For the devil, he'll supply them from church. We'll stay away. When the people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep those folks away from church, he offers them excuses. Your excuses don't really hold water. Please tell me your excuses again. And let's compare. 
I guarantee you your excuse is going to fail. I guarantee you it will fail. I mean, I guarantee you it will fail. Do you realize I can't give excuses? Because the moment I try to give excuse, God will show me someone who's doing more with a less. And I, well, you know, there goes my excuse. It don't work for me. Oh, pastor is always doing, oh, I know people who are doing more. Who make less. Oh, yeah, I, every once in a while, we get contacted by someone in some other country. We need help. Can you send like $200? And then they show pictures of everything they're doing. They're like, oh, you're done. That's $200. Goodness gracious. That's just $200. I, excuses don't work for me. So try one on me. Go ahead. Donna, I love excuses, right? Right, Lizzie? Lizzie's my child. I love excuses, don't I? Give me your excuse for failing. Come on, I want to hear. You better be very inventive, I'm telling you. You can't better, you, you don't give me the same that... I've heard before. You, you're going to have to come out with something that some, you know, I saw some alien come down from space and they beamed me up and all of a sudden I, I couldn't be myself and I had an outer body experience and then, you know, and then four hours later I was in my house and I still have the mark of where they did the operation and that's why I couldn't do what you asked me to do because I was in my body but absent from my body. You better get inventive and AI. You get an A plus for trying. Okay. <laughs> Sit there and give me the same. My dog ate it. Really? He don't even have a dog. <laughs> I taught in Atlanta, man, and I had a kid that gave me, he gave me an excuse, and it was so good. It was such a good excuse. And I said, you know what? I'm going to give you a B just for that excuse. That was really, really, really good. Mr. White, that's not right. He didn't do the assignment. Oh, yeah. But, man, he had to really think for that excuse. So I'm going to give him a B on effort. That was, that was, ooh, goodness. You need to write some books. That was good. <laughs> that's not what we do at church. Our excuses are lame. They really are. God don't want to know your excuses. Think about it. God sent his son to come and die in your place. You think your excuses are going to hold water? He didn't accept it from Jesus. Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. You can do all things, Father. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will. Let your will be done. Oh, he didn't take Jesus' excuse. Because that's the one time that Jesus was trying to find an excuse. Come on, read your own scripture. You're going to find out that one time he was bleeding. Sweat was blood. Trying to find an excuse. Let this pass. Let this pass. Not the pain of the cross. Jesus was prepared for the pain of the cross. He was not prepared for I'm going to be separate from my father whom I've always known. Who we've always been one. That's what he didn't want. I didn't want to be separated from him. And here, what excuses you give? God designed you and he knows what you need. Can you trust him? All your excuses that you make are what have made you who you are today. Your excuses have been your foundation and your building blocks. And as long as you remain with those same excuses, your structure will remain the same. Unmovable, inoperative, because you are your excuses.
Go ahead and think it through. The moment you get rid of your excuses, you branch out of who you are right now and become something different. See, I can come from a third world country into this country of opportunity, but third world still is in me that even though I am here, I will still live in the same condition that I lived over there because what's in me has not changed. For me to change, I have to get rid of what's in me. See, some of us see a lot of immigrants who come here. They live like third world condition. They have children that are born here who also live in third world conditions, even though they've never lived in the third world. Why? What's in them is what it's going to come out of them. What's in you? All your excuses over the years are who you are. See, we have Donna and Donna. I'm always fussing about her excuses. And I love Donna. You used to know there's some people I don't feel as free. I feel a lot freer with Donna. So whenever she said an excuse, I fuss about the excuses. Donna, you saw me doing this. Why didn't you just follow what I was saying? Well, because I thought I was going to hit that. That's your excuse. If you were to do what I asked you to do, you would have done just fine. I, too, have a CDL in driving a bus. I have the experience. I have driven it in third world countries on roads that are not American roads. Can you trust my direction? She did it again. She couldn't trust my direction. She did what she wanted to do. You know what I did? I got in the bus and took the wheel. Now look at this. God designed you and he knows what you need. Can you trust him? It was a matter of trust. While I was giving her directions, you know what she was saying? I don't trust your directions. So what had to change? I had to take the wheel. And I didn't go back, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back. I didn't do that. I just went back. One time, went back. You know what was the proof I knew what I was doing? I got the bus to the point it needed to go safely. That was the proof. Donna, you know why you failed? No, Pastor, you keep doubting what you were asked to do. Therefore, you doubt yourself. You doubt you. When I was giving you directions, I didn't doubt you. It wasn't my fault. I am now doubting you. I feel you can follow the directions. You second guess yourself. Oh man, I know that this is already is a point that we are starting to understand. You have failed so far because you have accepted your excuses and therefore accepted your failures. Start denying your excuses. Come on, take them one by one. Start denying because that's part of who you are. You have become your excuses. So start denying those excuses. I'm not smart enough. Xing you out. I'm not gifted enough. Xing you out. I'm not called for it. Xing you out. They don't really need me. Xing. Start taking all of those. And you know, after, after you finish, you're going to feel naked. Because that's what you've learned. That that's who you are. So when you finish acting everything out, well, I am nobody. And then God says, now you're somebody. Now you're somebody. Father, let me become less and you can become greater still. Let me get to the point and 
Father, if you have to hurt my feelings every Sunday, hurt my feelings every Sunday so I can get rid of this chunk that is making my life miserable. And I've learned to just take being miserable and think that that's living. But I'm tired of being miserable. I want to have purpose to what I am doing. Father, all my negatives make them positives. I want to start with good. Because that's the first level. Lord God, make who I am good. Make me good. But don't let me feel comfortable with good. Make me acceptable. So I can move on to the next thing that you've called me to. See, once you start getting rid of those negatives, you start adding ne positives. You start getting one triumph. And then another triumph. And then another triumph. And then another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. And after a while, you will discover you are a different person. How did you become different? Instead of listening to all the what you can't do, you start listening to all you can do. All of God's promises are yes and amen. Wait, if God says, I want to tell you yes, why does God keep telling me no? When he says, all my promises are yes, but I keep hearing no, it's because you're still so full of yourself that as long as you're full of yourself, you can't move into what God has for you. I want to move into what God has for me. I want to move to hearing yes before I even ask the question. I want to move to that. I want to move. There are no excuses. And see, sometimes we give excuses when the best thing to have do to do was to do nothing. Say nothing. Sometimes we give excuses when no one asked you anything. <laughs> Donna, she'll come in. Pastor, I turn off this light and I turn off the other light and I turn this out and I disconnected this and I disconnected the other. And, I, and I'm like, I didn't ask Donna for any of that information. What? And see, Donna doesn't know that after she leaves the room, I just start laughing. Because I'm like, what in the world? Donna would disconnect the extension cord from the plug, but then disconnect everything that was connected to the extension cord. So, you know, when you're working outside with power tools and you're like, okay, I don't have power. So you go plug up the main plug and you back go to the tool and it still don't turn on. And you're like, okay, that's plugged in. And then you look over there and say, oh, my tool is not plugged up to the power cord. And you plug up the power cord and then you turn on the tool. But it still don't turn on. And you're like, wait a second, it's plugged up to the power and it's plugged up to the extension cord. So then you walk the extension cord and the extension cord is not plugged up to the tri extension cord. So now you got to plug up the extension cord, the extension cord and hoping that this time the power will turn on. And sit there and turn on the power. And I'm like, why did Donna disconnect all this stuff? <laughs> I might like, would have been easier just to disconnect the first one. Okay, I'll disconnect it. <laughs> so she doesn't know. I ain't up. I'm not mad. I'm laughing because this is funny. I'm like, she's trying to protect. I guess the building, us, the property. And it's like, okay, all of that wasn't necessary. <laughs> but I understand why she's doing it. So it's, I find it funny. <laughs> now, eventually, Donna will be like, I, pl I unplugged the main plug. Because all the other efforts become for nothing. Here's why we don't have time. Because you waste the time you have. So you don't have time. Some of you spend so much time planning to do stuff. At the end, you do nothing because you're so busy planning. Plan, 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 plan. I'm planning to do this. Really? Doesn't count. 
when you get to heaven, you're going to find out there are many people who had great ideas of things they wanted to do that never happened. Because it doesn't matter how much plans you have. It's how much things you've accomplished. How much you've accomplished. I need to know what's the will of God in my life. You need to know what's the will of God in your life. Well, God is not filtering his will through my will. I am not on God's committee of how to do things. And guess what? Neither are you. We do it his way. How he wants it. And honestly, God don't care if you don't, don't agree. I can prove it to you. God says, have you seen my servant Job? There's no one like him upon the earth. And towards the end of Job, he says this. When I was created all things that I asked for your advice. You see, he said he's the best thing since cheese. And then at the same time, he said, I don't need your opinion. So who are we? Are we better than Job? Who made us think we're better than Job? Because that's just a lie to make us feel better about who we are. Because when we compare, when we do honest comparisons, you want to compare, do honest comparisons. Honest. Don't inflate yourself. Do an honest comparison. How far have I gone this year? Well, stop looking at your kids. Because it's not about your kids, it's about you. How far have you gone this year? See, Donna's looking at me with a smile. She's, she's not... She's not my message, by the way. Is it that right? Donna looks at me and she, she shakes her head and she, mm -hmm, and then she says words. So, you know, she's my amen corner right now because my amen people are not here and my other amen person is not feeling too good. So, of course, they're making noise. I'm going to pay attention to them because they're uh, reacting to the message. Those of you who just get complimentative, To me, that's you're half asleep. You're really not listening. <laughs> so she's not, she's not my message. It says that she's my amen quarter, so I say her name a lot. But I also talk to her a lot. And I, t I talk to Sela a lot. Why do I talk to these two individuals more? Because they're around me more. That's all. Nothing spiritual. And I can guarantee you most of the time they don't want to hear from me. Because <laughs> sometimes it's not something nice. Sometimes it's not. But with every negative, Donna told me a few weeks ago, you, you hurt my feelings so bad, I wasn't coming back. And I said to her, I said, where were you going to go? I mean, you're going to go somewhere else and you're going to hear the same thing all over again, even though they didn't say any of it. Because when it's coming from God, someone can open the dictionary and begin with aardvark and you still hear something else. Because it's what God needs you to hear. So where are you going to run away to? Where are you going to run away from God? We had one to move to the Carolinas so they can run away from God. They didn't work. It didn't work. We're in Carolina. God lives there. No matter where you go, God lives there. God designed you. Do you understand that? God designed you. I think we miss it. Yeah, I really think we miss it. So I, I'm going to be a little more creative. Everybody put up both thumbs. Each one of your thumbs have different
prince. And no one in creation has ever had your thumbprints. No one has ever had your thumbprints. And no one will ever have your thumbprint. Okay, put your hand down. All right, the timbre of your voice, even though you can make yourself sound like somebody else and somebody else can make yourself sound like you, they do not have your timbre of your voice exactly like how your timbre of your voice is. Your voice is unique, and there's no one on earth that has your voice. The veins on your brain are all made different than anyone that has ever lived upon earth. The vein structure on your brain are you unique to your own self. No one has ever had it like you. The veins within your eyeballs are all unique. No one has veins like the ones that are in your eyeball. No one does. You're the only person in all creation, in all history of time, to have the veins that way. So if you are somebody, why are you acting like a nobody? If God made you so unique that you are not like anyone else ever in the history of my, mankind, why do you fight God to be like everybody else? I believe that God made me unique on purpose because it required a design. So to have a design, there must be a designer. And the designer made me to be able to be seen a certain way. And I need to flow with a designer. Some of us stop fighting God just because you're stubborn. I don't care if you're stubborn because you just don't like authority. That's your problem. I don't care if you're stubborn because you're special needs. That's, that's your problem. That's part of your burden. I don't care what it is that makes you stubborn. But today, cross that one out. Today, that's one that I shouldn't have to carry. I'm going to stop being stubborn. I'm going to become an image of Christ. I am not my own, so I need to stop acting like I belong to myself. I have been bought and I am expensive. Come on, aren't you expensive? It requires the blood of Jesus. You're expensive. You were bought and you were expensive. You don't belong to you. So do what he wants you to do. You know what frustrates me as a pastor? To hear God's voice and know a direction that he's sending me. And then have our church member fight the whole way through. Because wherever God is sending me, I'm going to go. But some can slow down the process. See, you're not going to stop because I'm going to go where he wants to. He faithful to bring to completion what he started. I trust in God that I'm going to reach where he wants me to reach. Wouldn't it be easier if we can have some team players so we can win some games? Wouldn't that be easier? So today, let's start a new change. See, in three months, May, June, July, August, we're still going to be in May. We're going to have one year here. Do you know not everybody was a team player for us moving here? You know when that history is going to change? Never. It's history. It's done. We can't undo history. We're going to soon have a year here. We're going to soon have a year in spite of the naysayers. 
Wouldn't it have been easier if we had no naysayers? Wouldn't it be, have been easier if everybody just came on board? You know what? See, here's what you don't understand. You don't know it after today. In the year that we have been gone, the same reason why in last January we had to close the church because of the septic tank exploding in our building has become a constant problem in that building. If we didn't leave, that would have been our problem up to now. But I am so glad that God spoke something different. And for all the naysayers, you would have been full of poop often. I am so glad we moved. And the person who has taken it after us, this is their struggle. They've had someone to come and evaluate how much it's going to cost. One person said seven thousand. Another person said four thousand. The other person said two, two something thousand. Every time it rains, that stuff comes back up. It rained yesterday. What kind of service will we be having today? Not my will. Not your will either. I'm part of the church committee. So happy for you. If God says something opposite from you, let God be true in every man a liar. What God did for us, if we didn't move, we'll be sorry we didn't move. We would have been sorry. Hey, I can invite Dea so she can tell you the struggles that she's had. Her husband says we have spent more money on that building than money we made in one year. I'm so glad that I was listening. I'm so glad. Whenever we're moving, I don't agree. Are you God? All right. Last thing and I'm going to finish. If God is saying to go a direction and you're saying to go the opposite direction, are you with God or are you an antichrist? It's really bad when I use the terms, right? Because what does antichrist mean? Against Christ. Which one are you? We have had a lot of naysayers over the years, and we'll continue to have more naysayers. But we should be moving on to understand certain things. First of all, I'm not crazy. It makes no sense for me to make a greater investment on this than it means for me to make an investment on my own family. That doesn't make any sense in any country. But when I'm going to make a greater investment in this than I'm making in my own family, do know that I believe, hey, if you can't trust God, you can't trust no one. And I trust in God. For what we put down on here, I could have paid off my house. That makes sense. No more mortgage payment. Hey, that makes sense. Put it on the church for us to worship. That makes sense. It is what God said. How did you know it was what God said? Because a week before I didn't have the money. 
and a week later I had it. That's all I know. Now some of you go back into your bank account and you're going to find out that during that same time you had more money in your bank account. I'm glad that we have bank accounts so you can look back. Some of you got some added money in there that was not normal for that part time of the year. Sorry to have to tell you. Some of you got it right. It was seed money. Some of you got it wrong. You ate the seed. Hey, it's your own bank account. You can go take a look. What's the difference? Those of you who gave your seed money will get a harvest. Those who ate the seed, there's no harvest for you to get because you already ate it. See, I'm so grateful for those who are listening. There are some who gave who, just like me, didn't have it. But God gave it to them all of a sudden. And then God gave a word to go with it. I am now going to give you more money and you put it aside for when it is needed. We had two people in this church to get that word. Two. And I know the, the two who got that word. They got that word. Put up some money and you'll give it when needed. Two of our ladies got that word. And you know already three times God said it's needed. Give it. And all three have given three times already when God said it's needed. How awesome is that? You know what? They don't need money. They've now moved into a place where money keeps showing up. Donna's about to just jump out of her skin, y'all. She's just about to jump out of her skin. I'm telling you. Did you tell pastor that that's the word you got? The other one was Stella. She didn't tell me that's the word she got. I know it. And every time Donna has had close to $20 in the bank, she went from $20 to about $1,000. Every time. What an awesome thing. To live there. That's awesome. Had nothing to do with her. Had to do with get rid of these excuses. Get rid of them. Get rid of the excuses. Come on, get rid of them. Get rid of the excuses. Hey, you want to know where the problem is? I'm telling you where the problem is. Is your excuses. Get rid of them. Erica's the whole message. She's been man, this is not the message I want to hear, Pastor. Just don't just don't want to hear this message. I was prepared for other messages, but I don't want to hear this message. Because here I am again. God is telling me the stuff I got to change. You know, the stuff that she's hearing, I didn't say anything about it. This message started and God just started pouring. Just a pour. And it goes like this. I am moving as in the cloud. You move with me or you stay behind. She wants to move with us. We're moving, y'all. Now we're not changing locations. We're moving in our sphere of influence. We're moving into an area where all of a sudden we barely had to where we're going to have abundance. And some of you are feeling it. And it doesn't feel comfortable. 
because you have to be around people who have and feel that you are supposed to be there. Now I feel like, what am I doing here? I shouldn't be here. That's not how God wants us to feel. God says in his word, let the rich, the poor say I'm rich. Is the poor lying? No, the poor is speaking to be rich. Come on, get it, please. The poor is speaking rich. So he becomes, he once was poor, but now he's rich. Let the poor say, I am rich. I, I am rich. I, I am rich. See, some of you look at me and my wife, and you make exceptions. And you've created an exception clause in the way you think. You have made that, that we are exceptions. You're a liar. We are no exceptions. We're subject to the same rules that you are subject to. Same rules. We have the same confines. We're not no super spiritual to where we hear all the answers from God. God has not helped me pass any tests. I know this because when I am taking the test, I hear no answers. And the answer is B. No, that doesn't happen. I have to read the questions, understand the question, and then give the best answer that I know of. Oh, but you're a prophet. God gives you the answers. No, he doesn't. God tells me about you. He tells me nothing about me. He tells me about you, but tells me nothing about my wife. Nothing about my kids. I get nothing that's personal. Did you get it? Your clause is out that window. No, I don't have no special treatment. I have to go through just like how you have to go through. My wife has to go through just like how you have to go through. We had my wife's friend from Tampa came to visit and she told my wife, you are so blessed. You have two great daughters and a great husband. And my wife said, you just sit back and you watch. And at the end of her having to go home, she says, you still have a great daughters and great husband. But man, you have to go through a lot. Your, all your other struggles, there are a lot of struggles. You got, you need help in every side and you can't get it. What did my wife say? Just watch. Just watch. Oh, she's just blessed because, you know, she's pastor's wife. Uh, my wife has this dyscalculia. Do you? That's a learning impairment. She's a school teacher with a learning impairment. And you don't? Come on, throw those excuses again. Or X them out. We have work to do. And as, as long as we want to stay in the slow lane, we're going to go slow. But we can commit to the Lord whatever we do. And he will establish our plans. We can commit to the Lord whatever we do. Here it is. God did not send me from Panama to Alabama so I can be common. If you want to be part of a common Baptist church, we got plenty to choose from. There's a lack of church in our area. God did not call my wife from the Republic, the Dominican Republic, to come over here and be common. Right now, that ship has sailed. She couldn't be common even if she wanted to. Because her success has already passed what has been the history of our state. The first 
Teacher of the Year for the region in the history of Alabama. That ship has sailed. She can't be common. Our church should not be full of common people. It should not. How do I know this? Because the anointing starts at the head of Aaron and then he goes all the way down to the very end of his beard. So if the leaders are not common, the people should not be common either. So if you are afraid right now, because God is calling you into an area of the unknown, don't embrace that fear, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but instead he has given us a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. So while you're sitting there and the enemy is telling you all the reasons why you can fail, please listen to what he's saying and say thank you for informing me of the things that could not happen. Because we are victors. Because the victory is ours. Because the battle is the Lord's. It's amazing that God never asks us to fight. Do you know that we're in a battle where we're never asked to fight? Is this a stand? You don't have to worry about the left, right hits. Stand. Put on your whole armor and stand. What a way to fight. Dress up for battle and stand there. See it in your man's eye. You're dressed up for battle and you're standing there. But the glory of God is upon you. That nothing can come near you. But you refuse to get dressed and you refuse to show up. So how can you experience the glory of God? Today, take away that that so easily besets you so you can run this race. Take the things away. and Some of you got it when you were little. Oh, baby, you may never be this and you may never be that, but I will love you. You know the southern way. Bless his little heart. Some of us have been cursed under the guise that we were blessed. Take that off. Come on, take it off. You know, one time I told somebody to take off what they were wearing and they went to the bathroom and actually took everything off and came back out and butt naked. And I'm like, that's not what I meant. It's not what I meant. <laughs> so please don't 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 take it so uh, it's symbolic. It's take take off your stuff spiritually. <laughs> I just got that in my head, and it was a guy, so it was like not a good thing in my head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's symbolic, okay? <laughs> Take that stuff off. Take it off of you. You know what it is. Now, how many of you have found no excuses? No, I think only one person understood the question. How many have found that there's no excuse that can stand right now. There's no excuse. So when I get before God, he's not going to say, Ronaldo, I know that I gave you a speech impediment when you were born, and therefore you couldn't go and preach all over the world because I gave you a speech impediment. Can you hear my speech impediment? But I was born with one. But I didn't have to stay that way. I had to learn to overcome what God had given me so I can know what triumph feels like. I was born with a speech impediment. 
my wife was born bow legged and dyscalculia. Ariel was born with autoimmune problems and she's allergic to the world. I mean, when you find people that have things that have been against them from a little, their triumph is more triumphant. <laughs> I like that word, triumphant. <laughs> Let's move on. So when we get before God, the glory that he gets from us would be triumphant. May God richly bless you.